again. I want to thank everyone for for being here for this, what promises to be a pretty lively panel discussion on the topic of is Taiwan studies um, dead? Um, provocative uh, title, of course. Uh, my name is Monty Broadig. I uh, work up the road in, can you not hear me? I work up the road. How's that possible? Hello? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try for a, a microphone. Apparently, my voice isn't carrying quite far enough here. Uh. Okay. Is is this working? Can you hear me any better? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, we're closer. Is that any better? No. <laughs> okay. Now? Speak into the mic. Here, we'll just get it close. Yeah. How's that? I don't have anything to pin it to up here, so I'll just have to hold it. Um, okay, so again, welcome. My name is Monty Broadit. I am uh, the director of the Center for Global Education. Uh, at Butler University, which is um, not too far away, just up the road in Indianapolis. Some of you may be aware we have a basketball team that does okay from <laughs> time to time, but we also have some pretty strong international uh, studies and programs and uh, are constantly striving to improve our uh, capacities in, in that way. Uh, I was very pleased to be invited to sort of be the chair for this panel on uh, Taiwan studies, the state of the field, uh, and uh, am pleased to introduce uh, the panelists um, our, uh, our first uh, speaker will be Professor Murray Rubenstein, uh, who uh, has been has recently retired as professor of history at uh, the City University of New York, and currently is a senior research associate at Columbia University. And he will be well known to probably everyone in the room for his uh, very long uh, uh, career of work uh, in Taiwan and, and, and in mainland China. Uh, our second presenter, as you heard if you were at the earlier panel. Uh, is not able to join us today. Jonathan Sullivan um, is uh, is presently um, at the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham, but he is in the process of making the transition to the University of Southampton, and we certainly wish him well in his uh, in his new position. Uh, because he is not here, Professor Rubenstein will probably touch on some of the uh, content of his paper in his remarks and. Uh, if anything needs to be filled in, I've recently read his uh, very solid paper as well, and we'll go into some of the details. Mm -hmm. And we will then turn to our, our discussant, Professor uh, Shelley Rigger, who is Brown Professor of East Asian Politics and Chair of the Political Science uh, Program at Davidson College in uh, North Carolina. She uh, is joining us via Skype, um, and I think we have an opportunity to see her. Hello, Shelley. Uh, uh, but she just is not seeing us because we were embarrassed and didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in any case, um, uh, that's the order in which we will go, and I will simply uh, turn uh, the microphone over to Professor Rubenstein. We're going to need to use both of these. Over Shelley, you can learn how to use that. So, here we go. Okay. Um, number one, hi, Shelley. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk through uh, two related papers. Um, one uh, more than a little controversial, I think, and the other uh, my kind of mea culpa uh, and uh, a heavily one paper is an overview and then argues about or talk discusses the problem of Taiwan studies uh, in the first decade of uh, the new century and the new millennium, and the second sort of says, uh, or in it, the second sort of says, well, maybe I pushed things through far too far. Um, maybe it's uh, more than a little overkill to say that Taiwan studies is dead, and uh, maybe better uh, to look at death and transfiguration uh, as a way of, of, of taking in what happened. Um, the starting point is the paper, Is Taiwan Studies Dead, which has a, a, an interesting history. It initially was given at a conference held at Yale on Taiwan Studies. 
number of years ago, and uh, it would, uh, uh, produced uh, a volume that the Alpin Huey uh, has edited and is available in Chinese, but uh, given uh, the lords of publishing uh, did not uh, find an American <coughs> publisher yet, but uh, one hopes that it will, the, the conference was a very, very rich one. Uh, and covered a lot of ground and a lot of fields. Uh, the second venue ultimately became, um, in many ways, uh, a, uh, a better venue for the paper. Uh, I gave it as a keynote speech in uh, Madrid at the EATS conference, uh, which was a wonderful experience uh, all around. And I strongly suggest those of us who are kind of based in uh, the quote unquote new world uh, get involved in each in a number of ways because uh, their number one their venues are always interesting places and number two it's a rich group of powerful group of scholars who we may know or may not know but should know better uh, and brings in uh, a number of great universities Tuvigan for example the SOAS program we own etc uh, that we have a good sense of and I think it, it in many ways a lot has been happening in some ways more has been happening uh, in Europe in recent Taiwan studies than sometimes one finds in the United States. We're a little too complacent about it or we have shifted in a lot of ways so greatly to studying the PRC uh, that, that uh, Taiwan studies in our country become somewhat problematic and I think that to a degree still exists. Now, in Taiwan, in the first paper, is Taiwan Studies Dead. I wrote it uh, around 2006. And when you, if you remember the world at that point, or the world of Taiwan at that point, things weren't going all that well. This was in the um, second, uh, roughly around the beginning of the second and disputed uh, time of uh, Chen Shui Bian. Um, Everybody, uh, especially those of us who are Ninja Dong oriented, uh, were deeply disappointed at what went on, and I think there was a, a cast of mind uh, for a lot of people involved on Taiwan in the political world and also within Taiwan studies who tended to be more favorable to Ninja Dong than Roman Dong, uh, that, that things were awry somehow, that things were not working. Uh, and I think. The other reality was beginning to hit us very, very hard, and that is that China was realizing what everybody thought it would be many years ago, the superpower or the superpower becoming that uh, it had not become because of a lot of internal matters and uh, matters of, uh, shall we say, becoming, if you want to put it this way, Mao was too Trotskyite with continuing revolution to let his country develop. Uh, that's a simple explanation for a difficult issue. But beginning in 1980, the mid-1980s, uh, China begins to take off in a way that nobody, everybody expected but didn't know how quickly they would be able to take off. And I, I talk about that in the talk I'm giving tomorrow. But I think it has to be noted as, as part of the real issue concerning Taiwan. Taiwan had become a, 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 almost too comfortable for a lot of people. And it was high in the world, uh, you know, it was the great uh, small dragon that in Korea. There were a lot of positive aspects of the Taiwan that we knew. And somehow that begins to fade by the mid uh, part of the, uh, the first decade of the 21st century. The great suck-up was, had begun by 1992 and continued, the economic suck-up is what I'm talking about. And this took greater, the great became faster and faster, particularly after the uh, late uh, 1990s with the shift of the electronics industry, the computer industry, primarily to the Suzhou Shanghai Corridor, for example and other areas. Uh, Kaohsiung, for example, had lost a lot of its old sunset industries and now was dramatically changed in a lot of ways. And uh, Canton, uh, or uh, Guangdong in general, became the new Kaohsiung in terms of a lot of that industry, for example. 
All of these things are taking place in the real time world. The other thing I think I saw is, and I chart this out in some detail, is the shift within Taiwan that um, a lot of the old Taiwan hands, Weibull Ren, as well as people at the major think tanks, and my base is a, a, is a number of institutes at Academia Sinica as my kind of core area, a long time relationship uh, with uh, the Institute of Modern History, uh, a long time relationship with Chef Weibull and Mitsu so, uh, as well and also with uh, what is now Omei Enjoso. And what was then called in the good old days the Sanding June Institute or the Jungshan Institute, which never quite figured out quite what it was. Uh, and still may not have. Uh, I remember great ping pong uh, games uh, in that institute. But what was going on was a kind of sea change. And that was that a lot more programs had evolved recently Taiwan studies in Taiwan, but because they were Taiwan based, a lot of the students neither went to Japan nor to the West for PhDs. And a kind of insularity was evolving. Taiwan studies or the new generation of people was, were looking inward rather than having this trans-Pacific flavor in what they did, as the earlier generation had, and these are a lot of people that we know, and a lot of the, uh, the names in the field were part, and many of you here, were part of this uh, trans-Pacific movement. And that was beginning to change. And you could see all these things going on. You could see, uh, and, and it, it changed in another, to me, very dramatic way, and, and this is something that Hobart and Lynn know very, very well, even in the work of Liang, who is the most kind of localist, as I see it, of Taiwanese authors, the Lu Gang person, if you will. Uh, her work post-2000 uh, is more and more directed toward uh, the mainland, toward a larger universe. And she sort of admits that uh, herself. This is her, you know, she's gone beyond. And so, uh, you know, what was a kind of localist vision or an island vision by this key author is now becoming very, very much across the straits in a variety of important ways. All of these things kind of uh, are coalescing at this point. And at the AAS meeting in San Francisco, um, I asked, uh, I was head then of what was the Taiwan Studies Group. Um, that sort of died off simply because everybody was uh, looking toward the mainland, and this was happening again and again for a lot of people who had worked on Taiwan are now looking at the PRC. Uh, that becomes the new home uh, all the way around. I mean, the lure of the mainland, which you can see beginning as early as uh, 1979, when the first openings of American recognition occur, and then is accelerated, becomes greater and greater, which is a certain fever pitch. And I asked old friends who were at that meeting what their reaction was. Was there a crisis of sorts in Taiwan studies? What was the mood? And the mood, uh, and, and people, uh, Yvonne Zhang, for example, University of Texas, uh, Myron Cohen at uh, Columbia, uh, and a number of others were kind of admitting the fact that, yeah, we're maybe not, you know, Taiwan is there, but you've got to take the mainland in and in Increasingly, the mainland becomes the center of focus. So we're shifting our gaze in a variety of ways. And that impression was then reinforced um, later on that year when I was on Taiwan for uh, my, my yearly trip. And I met, uh, interviewed a lot of friends at Academia Sinica uh, and also uh, visiting scholars from the States, people whose work uh, most of us know. Um, at Academia Sinica, uh, Paul Katz had his say, and Paul kind of agreed, discussed the whole problem of the inward looking movement that was taking place. Uh, another scholar, Professor John, newly into PhD out of Harvard, was now part of the Taiwan History Institute, 
and was also having misgivings about what was going on in Taiwan and vis-a-vis Taiwan studies. And again, this sense of insularity that was taking place. Uh, Carolyn Tsai, who uh, was a mainstay, if you know Carolyn's work, uh, she did her uh, MA work at Taida. She then went uh, to Columbia, did a PhD uh, with Patty Zellin on the Japanese period in Taiwanese history and has written uh, an incredible amount of work in a variety of areas, institutional uh, studies and also now work on the veterans, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, close friend. And, even, and she was also expressing the same kind of wondering about where things are going in Taiwan. Uh, again, the end of the trans-Pacific element in, in Taiwan studies that everybody considered so important. And with that mood at hand, I began looking around and, and realizing even on Taiwan, and this in some ways refers to Stefan's paper, that there's a lot of Fujian and a lot of greater China in Taiwan, wherever you look. And, and that summer, given my mode of thought, given the, where I was, I seemed to see the, China, the cross straits influence more and more. You go to, for example, the Museum of History. At one time, a, a rather sad and somewhat dumpy place in a great location, uh, right in the Botanical <laughs> Garden. And there you see a refurbished, wonderful new museum, and it pushed the idea of the Chinese influence in a variety of ways. There was one exhibit uh, I talked about in the paper of a painter who was trained under the Japanese and also went to Europe and spent time in Europe, and his art goes from a Taiwanese flavor to it, to a Japanese flavor, to a heavily impressionist flavor. The, the kind of grand vision of uh, was no longer Taiwanese, it was in many ways universal, or certainly there's a heavy European and Japanese element. And as we know, the Japanese played a major role in being the place where many painters did get their basic education. So that could be seen. The other thing that could be seen, this goes back, was a, a very interesting exhibit of furniture, Qingdai furniture, at the same museum. And what it showed was that are we looking at quote-unquote Taiwan or are we looking at Fujian slash Taiwan? And the Fujian factor has to be a major part. Taiwan, majority population, came over the last 400 years from southern Fujian. And the denial of that, which some people want to you know, push, cannot be made in a variety of ways, certainly not in Qing Dynasty where the process is still taking place. So that you, I saw all of these elements and I wondered where is Taiwan in all of this and how viable is Taiwan? And then talking to other friends who say, well, if you've got a degree in Taiwan studies, all of a sudden somehow you're marginalized. Okay, and, and that was, the statement was made on a, you know, by Chris Lupke, for example, who's done a lot of work, very important work, and yet this was his feeling. This was at, by the way, the Colorado meeting, and that's where he and I had heavy duty conversations on a lot of things, and one of the points he made stuck in my mind about that, that the whole status of just studying Taiwan is not enough, so people have to broaden their focus. And a lot of this is coalescing in that article, Is Taiwan Studies Day? I asked that question. Now, um, last year, and this became a, a key point, which is very personal, I was lucky enough, or Columbia was lucky enough, to be granted a TECO grant to develop courses in Taiwan studies. And Myron Cohen, uh, an old friend, uh, had asked me if I wanted to uh, work with him on the project. So from uh, the fall of 2010 to uh, the spring, through the spring of uh, 2011, we worked on courses, and then I, he and I taught some of these courses together. And my base was his second office. He was then and remains the chair of the Weatherhead Institute. That's office number one. He had an office at the uh, East Asian Institute, uh, office number two. And he still has a two-office suite in the Department of Anthropology, uh, one of the most famous and in many ways one of the most contentious departments of anthropology in the country, if not the world. Uh, 
So I had his office number two, which turns out to be a, a kind of personal library, his personal library of everything related to Taiwan, going back to the dissertations of some of the, the uh, more famous uh, founders of Taiwan studies, including Arthur Wolf, for example. And being in that mini library uh, and then being asked to give a paper at the uh, Zhao Tong conference, uh, Henry Tsai, who I mentioned before, the author of a brilliant biography of Li Dong Hui, a number of important works on the Ming Dynasty, and most recently Maritime Taiwan, uh, was chair of a large-scale program or institute in Zhao Tong. I mean, all of a sudden, the, the engineers who created all the mini circuits and the basis for the Taiwanese uh, computer revolution realized maybe there's something called liberal arts, and it's not enough just to have uh, uh, a neighbor that is a liberal arts university, Jinghua, right next door, or literally over, you know, around the block or across the street. And so they developed the program, and this was a signal conference. I Talk, uh, developed a long, long paper that became a counter-argument to his Taiwan studies death. I had been the, I had seen at least the government of Taiwan's interest in Taiwan studies by the grant that we got, or a rather generous grant, to develop courses. And in fact, there's a permanent course on, an overview course on Taiwan studies uh, on the nature of Taiwan now in Colombia. There's another course in Chinese religion, uh, Taiwanese religion, or religion on Taiwan at Colombia. And there was the seminar course, which in many ways was the most wonderful way to teach I've ever been involved in. And Myra and Cohen and I got together a lot of our good friends, uh, Taiwan hands throughout the United States and brought them to speak. Uh, Scott was there, for example. Um, Steve Sangren was there, Robert Weller was there, Jack Wills was there, Shelley Rieger, Shelley, hello, thank you for that, um, et cetera, et cetera. And those students had as rich an experience in Taiwan studies as I've ever seen and kind of, and the whole experience said, well, maybe I was a bit too gloomy, maybe I was thinking of end of days too much. And this second and longer paper, uh, Taiwan studies, uh, is Taiwan Studies Dead is uh, about 24 pages long. Uh, the paper that followed it is almost triple its length for a variety of reasons. Um, it needs a bit more editing, and forgive me uh, for that. But uh, and this paper kind of answers the question. I say very simply, no, it's not dead, and let's look at the long history of Taiwan. So in one case, you've got something of a polemic. And in the other case, you've got a long bibliographical slash historiographical piece. So I would hope that people find it useful in that way. Now, I, it, it has one very large failing. It doesn't make use of the material, the literature in Chinese. It is primarily English language. Uh, so it gives a wider audience for those who don't have the Chinese, but points the way to uh, a, a bibliog a other bibliography as well, and people have to be aware that it needs that other side. And what I do in that paper is trace writing about Taiwan, going back as far as one first had some of the major books about Taiwan. The first stage I call a proto-Taiwan study stage. And it goes from basically the 19th century uh, all the way through 1959. Uh, why 1959? That's roughly the time that Fulbright began sending people to Taiwan. All of a sudden, we were, uh, Taiwan was good enough to have Fulbrighters, and some of us took full advantage of that uh, in terms of research, and vice versa. Many people from Taiwan were able to come to the United States. And by then, in a lot of ways, the American attempt to help redefine the direction of Taiwan's economy and society was well underway. In fact, it was about to go through a major sea change vis-a-vis -vis the work of KT Lee and others uh, that would be the strong basis for the economic miracle. So 59 is a very pivotal year. It is also the year that uh, 
Chiang Kai-shek uh, gives up the dream of the mainland, he's told very simply, uh, spend your money differently. Uh, you're not going back home. You can't go back home. Uh, enough provocation along the straits, and this was told to him rather directly by uh, the American Secretary of State. In fact, the message had been sent through the treaty of 1955. We had the crisis in which uh, Eisenhower was asked very clearly, are you going to use the bomb or not? And he uh, was great at totally befuddling uh, the American press. And they didn't know what the heck he was talking about, so he never gave a straight answer. But he was then well angry at Taiwan for even creating a situation in which trouble would result and, and uh, you know, the bomb would have to be brought in. Okay? I mean, this was a, a very serious uh, kind of issue. Uh, I would add, by the way, that we now know primarily from Jay Taylor's biography of John Jing Wall that um, Eisenhower, told, through various channels, told the Chinese uh, that maybe the bomb would be useful to end the Korean War. Uh, rather scary. Of course, we know that when it comes to 1954, and the Geneva Accords, he went the other way on Admiral Radford's uh, attempt to use uh, the atomic bomb to save the French ship in their disaster at the Fu. But here again, the bomb came up in 55. That's the sea change that goes on. Before that, we have a lot of interesting books. Some of you may have read them. The Pickering book, for example, this is a, a grand um, kind of Horatio Alger story of a kid who basically goes as a low-end seaman to East Asia and becomes a major figure in diplomacy and trade, etc., and spends time on Taiwan and gives a very rich account of everything he did, including the time on Taiwan. And then you have the missionary accounts, and these are particularly valuable. You've got Mackay up north, the great Canadian, who gives his memoir, but it's not simply a memoir, it's really a kind of overview of Taiwan that he loves very dearly. And you have some sense of, uh, of, of Mackay, a, a fascinating and in some ways somewhat bizarre kind of man. Um, you don't want to be treated uh, by his dental skills as he wandered through uh, North Taiwan taking people's teeth out without little things like any kind of anesthetic and then went on. You know, I don't know how many souls he saved. He probably saved people from a lot of pain, but think of the pain of an extraction as you stand there, okay? <laughs> Uh, and took another interesting step, a controversial step, and that is married of what most people guess is a Plains Aboriginal. Okay. Um, interesting man. His counter down south, uh, now remember, this may be because he's Canadian, I don't know. Uh, okay, or, uh, you know, I, I'll leave it at that. You can take it for what you will. Uh, okay. Um, I'm a Yankee fan, so that's how I go with these things. If you're a baseball fan, you know, you know Toronto and the Yankees don't like each other very much. <laughs> um, Mackay's presence is very definite, and in fact, when you walk up the great food street, etc., in Damshwe, at the end of that street, there's a gigantic head, and who are we looking at? We're looking at Mackay, George Wesley Mackay, staring us. And right behind him is the college, and right behind him is the chapel, etc. So his presence in Domsway is very dominant in a lot of ways. Down south, you've got Campbell, uh, one of the founders of the Presbyterian Missionary, who does a couple of things. Number one, a very notable long autobiography, and number two, a book in which he translates various texts about the Dutch period on Taiwan. It's really the first major source that we have on Dutch Taiwan that is available to those speaking English. It's a very, very important work in a couple of ways. And you can move from there to a variety of other books uh, that are missionary-oriented uh, up until uh, other books that, that, that begin coming out. Uh, a small book called The Fig Tree, which is a first-hand account of uh, 228 by a Japanese-trained teacher who then is teaching in uh, the mainland, but had experienced 228 and gives a dramatic account of that. And there's an English translation of that book, which is very, very powerful. Um, you also have a report from, from Mesa, uh, Formosa by a man named Sir uh, Bates, I believe it is, 
a rather interesting uh, hyper right winger. And he does something very dangerous. And you wonder why he existed after that. He deeply criticizes Gang Jinpo and, and talks about the uh, killings at the ball field. And uh, this book is written close to source, 1951. The fact that he walked out alive is pretty lucky, if you think about it. Okay, garrison command, etc. We have a different vision of John Jin Guo. Uh, we have uh, the savior of Shanghai, the only viable government, uh, perhaps the only viable city government uh, during the uh, Guomindang era. And then, of course, we have the new John Jin Guo, uh, the reformed John Jin Guo, who becomes the, the man who leads the way toward democratization. We do not have Zhang Jingbo, the head of garrison command, and in that little book, uh, we see him as head of garrison command. And the uh, power of the white terror at its bloodiest, I would put it. Okay. Um, so you have an interesting body of literature, and then Chen Chong, Chen Chong's uh, book, also published in English, is another major work. He is the president, he is in many ways the man behind the economic miracle, and did a very important look at the land reform that precedes the economic reforms, and that book is published in the late 50s. So this is a body of work. I don't pretend it's comprehensive, but one has to look at this early literature. 59, we see the coming of the Fulbrighters, and we also see the coming of the new generation. The, this, and a lot of people begin doing their field work after 1959 a little before 59 and after 59, and producing first dissertations and then books. And this period lasts from 1959 to 1979, 19, really, 1978, formerly the end of 1978. And this is the period of the giants in a, a lot of ways, people I think you know, many of us know. Myron Cohen fits his work, basic work fits into this period. Arthur Wolfe's major work and Marjorie Wolfe's is the first wife's major work, fits into this key, key period. Uh, David Jordan's classic work uh, fits into this uh, period as well. Uh, Bernard Galen's work, again, fits into this work. Norma Diamond. These are all people that we know, primarily anthropologists doing their field work. This is the first generation. And what I see in this period is what I had mentioned in, in my question to step on the whole question of Taiwan being China. Taiwan being the surrogate for China and the Taiwanese experience being seen as the Chinese experience. And that point is made in um, the titles of the various books. Uh, Galen's book, for example, says, I, uh, you know, uh, this is a village in China. Okay, yes, yeah, technically it's ROC, but is it China? Interesting question. Okay. Uh, the other books, again, take Taiwan as China. Why? Because it's the only China you have access to. And this goes on year after year after year. Um, there's a number of major works. The Wolf dissertation that then becomes a book, for example. Myron Cohen's dissertation that then becomes the book uh, about uh, Mei Nong. And by the way, he is now an honorary citizen of Maynong and goes back every year if he can. And last year, I think he took his family back. Um, and, and of course, in Myron's case, to go back, he was part of the other problem because a lot of his work was also done in the mainland, so he has a comparative base to work with. But the classic work is done in the 1960s, 1970s, when the book was published. Joanna uh, menzel Meskill doing her work on the Linz. Lin family, the Linz of Wufong. Uh, the one we know better, I think, is the, uh, the Lin family in Ban Zhao because it's a subway ride away from Taipei, or now technically the, law, the new Taipei, I'll put it that way. Uh, in the old days, it was Taipei City and Taipei County, but whatever it is. And that's the most stunning example of, uh, of shall we say, Qing, the Qing in Taiwan and a powerful family that was representing what the gentry we thought was like, not realizing it may not be exactly that, but the gentry class or the, the powerful class differed depending on where you are in China. Okay. Uh, and her book is a, a kind of breakthrough in that field. That was her first immersion in that field. 
Um, so that bit by bit, new works start coming out uh, increasingly. What a lot of people don't look at, and I think should, are the variety of works by missionaries, then trying to capture a variety of things. And I give you a number of examples of that. Books published on Taiwan uh, and very useful to the missionaries then coming in, primarily Protestant missionaries. And what they try to do is open up the world of ninja and sunja. They talk about Chinese religion or Taiwanese religion slash Chinese religion. Uh, they look at uh, the, uh, the village life. Uh, they look at a variety of kinds of issues and their bias is very clear. They are missionaries writing to criticize, quote unquote, the paganism that they see. But in turn, even in spite of this, they're pretty good observers of what goes on. So if you extract the negative message that is at the end of each of these portraits of the given uh, examples of folk religion, you have fairly solid ethnographic accounts. And then they've got to do the, but this is all we know, as impressive as these temples are, as interesting this stuff is, it's all paganism, doesn't, so it doesn't count. Uh, you can wipe out those sections if you don't particularly want to see Mazu as a pagan cult, if you will. I don't. I you know, pray to the goddess every time I can. Um, and the other gods, I hedge my bets, and, which is why I love the Lungshan Temple. Okay, you've got the whole thing, and everybody blesses you, and I always go the day before I travel, so it's worked so far. Uh, and I would, personal note, I would add, it was a lot of fun meeting these kids from the States who are there on a missionary tour, explaining to them that this is either the center of evil or the implicit power of popular religion. They didn't know quite what to do with that response. I was being a little tongue-in-cheek about the whole thing, but, you know. Now, a lot of that literature is very interesting. What's also important is the literature produced in the States by evangelicals about Taiwan, the work of Alice Helen Sweeten, uh, and a whole group of others. All of these books came out primarily over the course of the 1970s. And they were rich, detailed looks at a problem that the missionaries were dealing with, and that is, why isn't Taiwan Christian? Because in the 1950s and into the 60s, as the society was still coming out of the trauma of 228, the trauma of uh, hyperinflation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Christianity was making a very, very uh, great uh, bringing in the flock. There were lots and lots of churches there. They were all full. The Catholic Church expanded dramatically. Presbyterian numbers grew. Um, other churches catered primarily to the Waishan Ren, and those churches grew, particularly the Southern Baptist Church. And then by the 1960s, as the economic miracle takes hold, and through the 1970s and to this day, a kind of uh, plateau had been reached. People were not converting. In fact, the opposite was occurring, that people were spending money on temples in Beigong, in, in Daja, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, all the great temples we knew got a kind of reinfusion of money and new temples began. And it was demonstrating basically that uh, with success came the need to thank those who helped you. And it wasn't Christ. It was Mazu. It was Guang Gong. It was Bao Sheng Da Di, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And they, the missionaries are trying to figure out what happened in these books, are their attempt at coping with this real problem. Um, all of this comes to an end with uh, the, the, the end was in sight with the Nixon visit, which also produced a very interesting opera. And uh, Nixon's uh, immortal comment, yes indeed, this is a great wall, I think I got it right. Um, John Adams wrote the opera and the Met has done it, so I guess it counts. Um, Metropolitan Opera, forgive my New York chauvinism. Um, but what happens is there is the de-recognition, which is a shock to the system in a variety of ways. But in a lot of ways, that shock to the system is valuable for people studying Taiwan because we do not have to exist under the idea that when you talk about Taiwan, you're really talking about China. 
Taiwan becomes a thing unto itself. It becomes Taiwan for the sake of Taiwan. And in a lot of ways, a richer, more telling scholarship evolves because people don't have to say everything that happens happens in China as well because this is the real China. Okay. Um, and so you begin, what you also begin to see is that many of the students of this first generation begin doing interesting work. And particularly, if you see this in the 90s when the work is being done, and then in the, in the 80s as the work is being done, the field work is being done, and in the 90s as the work is then published. And here, I'm thinking about two people in particular, uh, Robert Weller uh, and uh, Steve Sanguin, both part of uh, the kind of what is called the uh, Sancha Mafia. Uh, i.e. the group of anthropologists who went to that village and went to that area and did deep studies in a variety of ways. Um, uh, I'll think of his name, but uh, and, and there are other scholars involved as well, and you again have a rich body of scholars. Emily Earn, for example, uh, did her work and then was the teacher of uh, or Weller, uh, etc. It's, it's a long list of people who did their work and produced important volumes post-1979. Uh, and that work is deeper, it's richer, it, and at the same time, these people are then working with Taiwanese who come to the States and begin doing their work, and in turn start coming home and producing a variety of work. Okay? And uh, a lot of those scholars, uh, John Sun, for example, is at uh, the Minju So, and has done important work in her book of essays, I think is a very important uh, piece of work uh, that she's produced. Uh, another scholar of that period uh, is Hu Tai Li, uh, and her monograph is Her Mother in Law's Village, very important work. She actually did her work at CUNY at City University of New York, uh, and now has become, I think, one of the preeminent documentary filmmakers about Taiwan, particularly about Aborigines. Uh, Stone Dreams, uh, I think, is a a masterpiece, though some have been critical. I, I, I love the movie from the beginning. Our other more detailed works about uh, various uh, uh traits, religion, etc., is very, very important. And she continues to be a, a major figure in, uh, in, in, in film, uh, documentary film, in a variety of ways. A whole group of other people begin producing. In the case of Sangren, his first work, heavy on uh, methodology, but strong as well. And field work, Weller's wonderfully uh, defined uh, uh, book as well. And a host of other anthropological studies. You also see the evolution of other kinds of work coming out. Uh, books on business, for example. A new uh, of, of uh, other books on the economy, for example. Um, in my own case, uh, a book on the Protestant community in Taiwan, researched in the 80s, coming out in 1991. And then a whole group of conference volumes that came out uh, over the same period. Uh, again, very rich, uh, very useful. Uh, uh, forgive the self-publicity, uh, you know, but The Other Taiwan is a book you may know, based on the work of a lot of scholars coming out in 1994. And again, Taiwan is at the center of it all in a variety of ways. Let's move to the, 19, the, the new decade. Here again, a different kind of sea change. Uh, again, important new work, economy coming first, two or three major books on trying to grapple with the nature of the economy, uh, the collective works and also individual works, producing new insights into the nature of the Taiwan miracle. Very, very important in what they say, very important in providing a, a way of looking ahead. Uh, this is one of the richest areas. Uh, you know, uh, for example, Peter Joe's work over the last decade has been very important through essays and through a new book uh, in this regard. He teaches at City College of New York. Uh, again, the, the economists are now being able to look back and look at that world, and again, forgive uh, the self-publicity, but um, 
hopefully by uh, sometime in early next year, um, uh, a book that I uh, worked through, um, uh, a co-edited uh, on tech transfer will be out. And this looks at the direct issue of the non-governmental relationship with the PRC. The, and again, makes the point of liminality, if you will, you have tech transfer from Taiwan, from the United States to Taiwan in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. You have the development of a, an indigenous uh, computer-based industry, chip industry, etc., in the course of the 70s and, eight, uh, 70s and 80s into the 90s, and then beginning in the 90s, you have the shift to the mainland, particularly in the late 90s, when a lot of our uh, money and uh, man time, man hours, I spent developing the Suzhou-Shanghai Corridor, and here is the development of a new Taiwan-sponsored PRC industry, but with heavy connections to Taiwan. So this, this ongoing process is now a subject of uh, uh, you know, serious uh, work, and Doug Fuller has kind of pioneered this, and uh, Doug and I have worked together with a number of other scholars, including Megan Green, to have a volume that's coming out on the whole process. Uh, other stuff has been done, and the vitality of Taiwan goes on. And in a sense, let me end uh, why that seminar I talked about before. The ROC government, particularly valuable, is very aware of the competition provided by the PRC, the Confucius Institute push. In Leipzig, for example, you see a Confucian Institute. What's interesting there is the man chosen for that job, who in part is a Taiwan hand, writing about spirit writing and spirit idioms, and now becoming a Confucian because he's the head of the Confucian Institute. Uh, you have, uh, and this push is all over Europe, we see it in America, and it's there. The Jiayu Bu answered by providing senior scholar grants, by providing other kinds of grants to Taiwan, studies grant that we got uh, at Columbia was part of this process. The final moment came, and I, uh, some of us were there just about a month ago, the first Congress of Taiwan Studies, in which uh, Michael Chao and people at, at, at Academia Sinica brought together people from almost everywhere, Taiwan, uh, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, there were two each panels, as I recall. And that panel, uh, that meeting, demonstrated the power, the vitality of Taiwan studies. And in a sense, it, it, it's a way of answering the question, is Taiwan studies dead? No, it has changed, and in what, well, many ways has become stronger than ever. Thank you. time there will be opportunities for uh, discussion with the audience. Uh, I think we'll proceed with me giving a, a very brief uh, overview of Professor Sullivan's uh, paper and then move to uh, Dr. Rigger's comments. And following that, we will invite uh, lots of lively discussion about these topics. Uh, let me take just a couple of minutes. Um, when I was invited to uh, chair this panel and, and seeing the title, it was obviously a provocative title, is Taiwan Studies Dead. Um, it, it struck me that there are at least a couple of questions um, involved in the title. What do we mean by Taiwan studies? What are we referring to when we use that term? And what might we mean by dead? Right? Um, and I think, uh, I think we can assert, just looking at the room and looking at the, at the opening plenary, obviously Taiwan studies is not dead if by that we mean you know, people who were engaged in defining a key part of their scholarly or professional work by their studies of topics grounded in Taiwan, obviously the field is not dead because there are a lot of people here enacting it um, as we go forward. Um, but I do think it's in, important to think through a little bit what we mean by Taiwan studies as, as an enterprise. Uh, what are we referring to when we say that? Um, it's important to think about the ways in which Taiwan studies, like any kind of area studies, may be institutionalized and the ways that that kind of institutionalization changes 
over time. I mean, that's part of what's under, underlaying the comments that we've heard um, uh, so far. Uh, institutionalization takes a lot of different forms, of course, but a key one is jobs and people who are interested in working uh, on Taiwan or working on China or, or working on Nigeria, whatever might be defined as area studies. Can people in these fields who are thinking about their own professional work in this way find satisfying jobs with decent career prospects going forward? That's a, a key element of institutionalization. Can all of us get jobs that we find satisfying and allow us to do the kind of work that we do uh, and progress in our careers in satisfying ways? Tied to that, of course, is do we have access to the sorts of research funds that we might need to engage in the scholarly work that we do to advance our careers and to advance knowledge in the field. Um, do we have adequate publication outlets? And I know there's some disappointments there with various you know, publishing houses and their decisions about maintaining or not maintaining series. Um, but are there other adequate publication outlets, either as journal articles, for monographs, for full-length uh, volumes? Are there publishers and are there audiences for this work that, that justify the investment of the publishers? And of course, that's a very shifting target as we move into more digital ages. I mean, the, the nature of publication venue has, has shifted under our feet over the last couple of decades and, and will continue to do that. Uh, and another area, of course, is formal organizations, voluntary associations, professional associations devoted to Taiwan studies or having Taiwan studies as, as a chunk of, of what it might do, such as the Association of American Studies to take a, a largely North American-based um, example. I think all of these all of these areas of institutionalization are worth are worth a look if we're going to assess the vitality of a field. And uh, with that as, as by way of introduction, I'll, I'll simply turn to a, a very quick um, overview of Professor Sullivan's uh, paper, which I recommend highly to you. Each of you has access to it on the conference website, of course, and it was published in uh, China Quarterly last year. It is, I believe, a very you know, solid piece of empirical work where he, he takes some of these questions of institutionalization and, and tries to address them using actual data. Um, the, his main approach is uh, to, um, to focus on uh, journal articles, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles that are area studies in their, uh, in their general orientation, uh, China studies, Taiwan studies, or, or or area studies journals, and to take a look at um, the patterns of publication in these um, in these various journals. Um, he he does uh, mention an issue that has come up uh, right at the beginning of this article, which is the relationship between area studies, in this case Taiwan studies, and what he refers to as hegemonic disciplines. And this is an issue that will be familiar, I think, to anyone based in the United States, and probably to people based in Taiwan as well. Um, and it relates to jobs as well. In most American universities, the, the jobs are in academic departments that are defined by discipline. And if people want to get jobs in the first place in those departments and then want to advance in, in their careers in those departments, they have to be seen first and foremost as strongly, firmly grounded in their discipline. And whatever area of the world they're interested in studying has to be regarded as a sort of secondary thing. It's the place where you go to do research about some key theoretical uh, issue within your discipline. If you don't present yourself that way in most disciplines in the United States, whether that's history or economics or my own field, sociology, political science, you're going to have a tough time gaining access to publishing your work in the mainstream disciplinary journals, and you're going to face uh, suspicion, to put it mildly, on the part of some of your colleagues who, who look suspiciously at things like area studies and think you're not a real political scientist or you're not a real economist or which, whatever your, your field might be. So there is this, this tug and as a matter of self-preservation, people who are doing Taiwan studies or Nigerian studies or whatever the case may be um, uh, need to uh, certainly uh, orient themselves to the, di the hegemonic disciplines and frame their work in that way in order to, I think, to have a, a, a successful uh, career. So uh, Dr. Sullivan's paper really focuses, though, on research output and uh, publications largely in peer-reviewed um, journals. And he, you know, he asked a number of questions, is Taiwan studies marginalized within China studies? And um, I think he comes down to saying that, uh, well, 
one of his points in, in doing these content analyses of a large number of journals is about 10% of all the articles in, in China-focused journals during the period he's looking at, um, 2004 to 2008, I think, about 10% were, were focused on Taiwan. In my view, I mean, yes, I mean, if you just consider, you know, on a population per capita basis, that's not a bad, you know, that's not a, not a bad record. Uh, it, it shows signs of, of considerable interest. Um, he asks uh, people who are focusing their work on Taiwan where they would submit a, a, a strong journal article about Taiwan, and China Quarterly comes up as the as the top venue. Now, I'm sure no, had he asked the question differently, I'm sure a number of people would have responded with. Uh, front rank journals within their own disciplinary specialty as well, if they're taking on theoretical issues that matter within that discipline. Right? If they're if they're less theoretically driven by their discipline, trying quarterly probably is a really good venue. If they're more theoretically driven by their discipline, they may very well aim for publication in a disciplinary journal that's toward the top of their field rather than trying to quarterly, which I think is you know, almost universally regarded as the top of, of that field for uh, modern contemporary Chinese studies. Um, uh, he does address the issue of, of tenure and, and concerns about departments and disciplines, and, and I've already uh, said something about that. Um, he, in, the, in the work that he's looking at, he asks, is, are Taiwan studies marginalized? And, and he looks at um, the, uh, the proportion of published articles that, that are arrayed across different disciplines, whether it's, um, he looks closely at political science and international relations, other social sciences and humanities and, and, and related fields, and, and comes to see that an awful lot of the articles that are published in the, the range of journals he's looking at really have an international relations or politics uh, focus, and he argues for understandable reasons that a lot of interest in the West, in, in, in Europe and North America, uh, is related to um, either Taiwan domestic politics, processes of democratization, and, 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 and Belgium in that way, or uh, international relations, cross-states relations, and so on. And as you get um, uh, different uh, political cycles in Taiwan, say presidential elections, the volume of, of work that gets published rises because there's interest at that time in those kinds of topics. And so his suggestion is that what's marginalized in these, in these journals is not Taiwan studies, but disciplines other than international relations, political science, uh, and very, very closely related um, fields. Um, as even really in decline, certainly not on its deathbed, um, that there are ample publication venues, there's a lot of work going on. Um, the impact of disciplinary journal is important. Um, there is one point that he makes toward the end of the article that I think is worth reflection by all of us. Um, he asks a question about the degree of collaboration between uh, people focusing on Taiwan who are based in North America or, or Europe and people based on Taiwan. And judging from his limited empirical debate, so I'm talking about peer-reviewed journal articles, not the, what, the fuller range of scholarship, but based on his analysis of that data, he concludes that serious collaboration for research and publication in the East and East Indies is pretty minimal. It, that there's a lot of single-authored work, or where there's co-authored work, it's work that's authored by academics who are based in the same country. Now, he doesn't really address in this whether some of those people might be originally from Taiwan and working with a, a North American or European collaborator. But, but the basic point is that most of the research is where collaboration is going on. It's people based in the same country who are collaborating with each other. So people based in Taiwan are collaborating with others there. People based in North America are collaborating. You know, my own work on Taiwan has been fully collaborative and has um, benefited tremendously from that. And I always recommend, I'm, I'm in a position in my, uh, in my university of trying to promote international engagements across all of the world's regions uh, these days, not just you know, China and Taiwan. And one of my main messages to our faculty is you increase your, um, uh, your, the quality of your academic work, you increase the potential for getting research funding, you increase your publication venues, your work will be dramatically enriched if you find collaborators in the country that you're studying and work closely with them as, as real partners. Uh, so 
you know, I read Sullivan's conclusion with a, with a little bit of sadness and, but thinking that, you know, that's an opportunity. It, it seems to me that can be taken as a call for some greater collaboration. Right? I know in my own field of sociology, there are just tremendously well-trained and tremendously productive uh, researchers and, and people engaged in all kinds of theoretical work um, in Taiwan with whom I could regularly, or other sociologists could readily collaborate. Obviously that's true in fields of history and political science and you know, literature and film studies and uh, name your field, right? And Taiwan is just chock full of really highly trained, highly competent scholars. And so I think my final comment would just be to urge more of the kind of collaboration that, that Sullivan identifies as somewhat missing uh, in this field, that it would be to the health of everyone, it would be to the benefit of everyone in the field if we had greater uh, collaboration, truer sort of research and publication partnerships um, in this way. May I, may I make one kind of comment on that? I think the possibility you should have looked at published conference volumes or published volumes along those same lines because there the amount of involvement of Taiwanese scholars as well as Western scholars as well demonstrated. I mean, the, uh, the Alpin Kuei, David Wong book about the Japanese period is, is really uh, an example of a lot of the cooperation that goes on. David Wong and Carlos Rojas' book on literature, for example, represents again the, uh, the number of different scholars from different areas doing that kind of work. In my own work as well, the various the pieces of edited work, there's, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but there is uh, clearly many of the Taiwan-based scholars' uh, work is there. So I think that's another category, but it's a category that represents this ongoing kind of cooperation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for making that point. That's in fact one that Professor Sullivan does make in his work. He's careful to circumscribe, you know, the, the nature of his empirical work and the limitations of that, and he himself, you know, points to these other forms of scholarly collaboration. So I don't want to overstate the point, but I, I do think it's indicative, um, you know, where we're talking about publications in in the top peer-reviewed journals um, in the field. You know, some greater evidence of, of uh, close collaboration would certainly be welcome. Um, I think at this point, uh, it's uh, it's the opportunity for Professor Kelly Rigger, who's been uh, uh, listening, I think, uh, to to all of this, to offer her comments, and we can all uh, we can all see you, although you can't see us. But this is your turn, so please, um, you can take um, a, at least 20 minutes, and we'll still have plenty of time for um, discussions following your comments. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, and I'm, you know, out here sitting in my office in North Carolina, so if, if you have technical difficulties, you can't hear me, you can, you know, just start yelling or something. Let me know if I'm um, suddenly under inaudible. Okay, very good, we will. Okay, um, all right, so where I think I'd like to begin is first of all by thanking the organizers for tolerating this kind of high-tech solution to uh, modern communications, I guess, um, it's still, even in the era of wall-to-wall -wall electronic communications, ideal to meet in person, and I really would love to have been with you this weekend. Unfortunately, I have another uh, pretty significant obligation at my institution tomorrow morning, and I wasn't going to be able to manage uh, the trip. But I appreciate being invited, and I especially appreciate the opportunity to speak on this very, very important topic. Um, I'm glad, I'm, I'm extremely relieved to learn that even Murray's paper, or the first paper at least, was so um, sobering and pessimistic, has revised his assessment and determined that um, we're not quite dead yet. But I have been anticipating this moment for a long time when I first, well my very first work on Taiwan was in 1982 when I was an undergraduate and at that point I think we really felt that Taiwan was kind of on the way out, obviously not as a geography or as a human community, but as a political entity in the early 1980s after derecognition and normalization of U.S.-China relations, it seemed as if, you know, the, the kind of deal that Henry Kissinger uh, tacitly or implicitly offered Joe and I that you know, this, this problem will resolve itself in a manner satisfactory to you, we all, I think, pretty much 
believed that was where things were headed. And then things took a very different turn through the 80s and 90s. But when I finished my second um, and really first significant academic project on Taiwan, which was my dissertation, uh, faculty in the area of Chinese politics advised me that, you know, this is fine. You can write a book about Taiwan. You can write a dissertation about Taiwan and turn it into a book. But then you need to get on with you know, kind of studying real China because in the future, you know, 10 years from now, they said, nobody's going to really care about Taiwan anymore. So the idea that Taiwan studies is actually not dead is better news than you realize, those of you who are too young to have survived the earlier uh, sort of prognostications of its death and decline. So, you know, we're, we're still here, we're still doing Taiwan studies, and that's good. And kind of a relief after the um, title of this panel. However, I think we do have to ask the question, or, or we still want to, I still am interested in paying attention to the question that Jonathan Sullivan raises in his article, which is not, is Taiwan studies dead, but is Taiwan studies in decline? And I want to kind of approach the question of decline by uh, looking at two related other questions. Decline, has Taiwan studies declined, or is Taiwan studies declining compared to what? That's the first question. And then the related question is, what is the purpose of Taiwan studies? And I think how we understand or where we gather the impression or the concern that Taiwan studies is in decline is very much related to how we understand, and I think for the most part, um, unconsciously or subconsciously, how we understand the purpose or value of Taiwan studies so compared to what? Well, the first way that we could say Taiwan studies is in decline is as compared to other similar countries. And here, I just don't know the answer because I don't study other similar countries. I don't study, for example, Ghana, a country with a similar sized population to Taiwan. Um, so I don't know. Is Ghanaian studies more vibrant? than Taiwan studies, less vibrant than Taiwan studies. Um, I am interested to know, you know, uh, uh, Murray Rubenstein just told us that the AAS group for Taiwan studies has kind of petered out, if, uh, correct me if I'm getting that wrong, Murray, but uh, is there a Lao People's Republic group within the AAS? Is there a, a Thailand group? Is there a Mongolia group? You know, so is Taiwan in decline? Well, my guess is that actually for a country of its size, Taiwan studies is actually, and especially Taiwan studies outside of Taiwan, but even inside Taiwan, because of the nature of that society, because of the nature of and the uh, vibrancy of the academic life and community in that country, I suspect that Taiwan studies is actually probably relatively well-developed and robust compared to other similar kind of geographic or national contexts. But I really, that's that's a guess, not, um, I didn't do the kind of research that Jonathan Sullivan did, so I can't really say. So, you know, that's one possibility. One way we might make this kind of comparison, I think, a more interesting comparison, and one that I suspect drives more of us as we think about whether or not Taiwan studies is in decline, is, is, in, is Taiwan studies in decline relative to what it deserves, right? The, the level of commitment of resources and brain power to Taiwan should not be driven by, you know, the size of its population or some other kind of objective indicator that we would apply elsewhere, it, it should be driven by the worthiness of Taiwan for study. And here, 
you know, I'm a, I'm a total believer, right? I just published a book called Why Taiwan Matters, trying to convince people not that Taiwan matters because it's geostrategically important or because they make a lot of motherboards, but because it matters because of the society, because of the human community that is there. So, you know, I feel like we should all be reading and writing about Taiwan all the time because it's such an inherently interesting and fabulous subject for our attention. Um, so that's kind of, you know, religion, not science. But I also think there's politics in this <laughs> dimension as well, which is um, we want Taiwan to be studied a lot, and we worry about what might seem like a diminution in Taiwan studies because the study of Taiwan is a kind of validation for Taiwan. And one of the things that we know about Taiwan is validation is important. And I think perhaps here I can, I am on slightly safer ground to say that validation is more important for Taiwan than for Ghana or Malaysia. Because Taiwan, unlike Ghana and Malaysia, occupies this liminal and shaky position in international politics and international recognition around the whole you know, sovereignty question so that those of us who have an interest in Taiwan, who care about Taiwan's future, are particularly sensitive to signs that Taiwan either is or is not kind of holding its ground in terms of international recognition in a way that, you know, other countries have other problems. They have other preoccupations. Taiwan's particular preoccupation, I think, is with not disappearing, with being visible to the world. So the fact that our attention to the possibility of a decline in Taiwan studies is, I think, related to one purpose of Taiwan studies, which is to validate and make visible <laughs> Taiwan as a subject, right? Both like subject in the sense of topic and then subject in the sense that fancy academics use the word subject. In both senses, Taiwan wants, we want Taiwan to be a subject in international fora and attention. For Taiwan, I think in general, this validation thing is, and, and here I'm talking really about the Taiwanese state and kind of institutions, mainly government institutions, but also academic institutions. Primarily, these institutions share our, the, the scholarly community's desire to maintain this level of validation and attention, but it's costly. It's expensive. Thinking about, listening to Murray talking about the AAS, I have to wonder, and it, it actually came up in Monty's comments as well, I have to ask myself, you know, in the 1980s and especially the 1990s, during the era of, let's face it, you know, President Lee Dong Hui was a big spender on international visibility for Taiwan. Did we get a little addicted to easy money? Did we get a little addicted to the idea that, you know, we could get grants from somebody in Taiwan to pay for a lot of research? I'm not sure that, you know, if there is a Lao People's Republic group within the AAS, I'm guessing that they are not funding their research through grants from the Laotian government or Laotian foundations. And I'm, I'm probably pretty certain that that doesn't happen with uh, Mongolia or other countries that are sort of under the umbrella of the AAS as much as it does with Taiwan. So that's not to say that, that there's anything wrong with um, collaborating with these kinds of institutions, with allowing the Taiwan, Taiwan's institutions to finance research on Taiwan. On the contrary, I think that's fantastic and has been really good for Taiwan, but what I see since 2000 is an increasing ambivalence among Taiwanese politicians in particular 
and citizens in as the sort of now the drivers, right, of a lot of decision making by the Taiwan government in a way that public opinion didn't drive decision making in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s, and even into the 90s to the same extent. You know, people are asking, like, why are we spending our money this way? So, you know, there was a there was a lot of uh, controversy and awkwardness and unpleasantness around this past, this most recent presidential election, because the standard practice of inviting large numbers of foreign academics, especially political scientists, to experience, and I'm not, I don't use the word observe because the purpose of those delegations was never to kind of certify the fairness or accuracy of Taiwan elections, but rather to give foreign observers the opportunity to experience an election in Taiwan in a young, but nonetheless very successful and consolidating democracy, that didn't happen this year. And I think part of the reason it didn't happen, and I don't fully understand why it didn't happen to the same extent uh, as in the past, but part of the reason I think is that it's, it's expensive. And Taiwanese are feeling pressed for money. And they're not sure how much of this kind of thing they want to pay for. And I think that's legit. I think budgets, state and, and certainly private foundation budgets around the world are contracting. But you know, I think it's hard to it's hard to maintain the same level of output if you're not maintaining the same level of resource allocation. So, you know, I think if part of the purpose of uh, Taiwan studies is validating Taiwan and bringing status and attention to Taiwan, then that's going to require a certain kind of resource allocation. And, and so if resources are not available, people have to think about how are we going to keep this, this going. Um, another way that we might think about compared to what, right, is Taiwan studies declining well compared to what, is compared to the state of the knowledge, right? We still have all this stuff we don't understand, all these topics we need to explore. So compared to the, the sort of volume of, of questions remaining to be answered, the research effort may appear to be declining. And that links to another possible purpose of Taiwan studies, which is to understand Taiwan, right? Not to, not nothing political, but just knowledge for its own sake in magic. And here, I think we really get into a, a, a very interesting question, which we probably would need someone like uh, Edward Said to help us unravel, which is the relationship between scholarship in the sort of traditional centers of scholarly production and knowledge, which is to say North America and Europe, where the, the sort of modern university and the modern apparatus of scholarly production as we know it originates, the relationship between that world and then the, the world of research that is done in other places that are connected absolutely and that participate in the kind of uh, you know epistemology of the modern university but that are kind of linguistically and perhaps increasingly now theoretically autonomous their own universes of ideas that connect but are not integral to or are not sort of co-located with the place where the kind of definition of what constitutes modern scholarship has primarily evolved. So uh, Murray Rubenstein in his first paper kind of critiques the uh, inward looking. So the, the Taiwanese scholarship about Taiwan that is 
rooted in Taiwan that doesn't, uh, you know, reach out so actively to the U.S., to Europe, to Japan, and and sort of implies. And again, Murray, you can tell me if I'm being unfair, but it seems to me there's a little implication. It's sort of an enable gazing going on in Taiwan. You guys aren't seeing the big picture, and I'm again not sure because. I'm so parochial and small-minded that I've only ever really studied one country and then, you know, I have to pay attention to China, to mainland China, I have to pay attention to Japan, I have to pay attention to Korea for various reasons related to my teaching and also my writing. But, you know, I don't know, do other countries have as much, more, less scholarship about themselves, for themselves than Taiwan? I don't know, but it seems to me appropriate that Taiwanese would, would have an interior conversation among themselves, which if foreigners, and say people who are not based in Taiwan, want to access that, then we have to do the work of entering it. Makes sense to me. Um, so I think, Maybe it's okay to have kind of, you know, worlds, planets orbiting one another, not always satellites orbiting one planet. Um, okay, state of knowledge. And then the, the last two points I want to make are about uh, Comparing, and, and here's where I think really this, the, the momentum or the impetus for the conversation we're having today comes from, is from the idea that Taiwan studies is in decline compared to the past. And I want to think about Taiwan studies compared to a more distant past and then a more recent past. And, and these ideas, these sort of frames have already been introduced in the conversation, but maybe I can say something a little bit different. Uh, the distant past, right, compared to, say, that kind of golden age of anthropology, not sure it was exactly a golden age for political science, right, the 50s, 60s, 70s. A lot of the political science produced in English in those decades had a, a political message or uh, intention behind it. It was anti-communist and I would venture to say to some extent it was apologetic for uh, a kind of single party authoritarianism that probably mm, political scientists should have been more critical of. Uh, so not exactly a golden age for political science, but okay, a golden age for anthropology. Looking back to that more distant era, Again, what was the purpose of studying Taiwan in that age? And I think for, for political scientists, the purpose of studying Taiwan in those decades was to show that, well, first of all, to continue to respect a, a friend, the Republic of China, right? Nationalist China. And also to use that regime to critique the other China. So for political scientists, I think, to a great extent, scholarship in that era had a kind of political purpose, which was as a critique of so-called communist China, so-called red China, right? The whole free China thing was about that. Um, for anthropologists and others, I think that golden age of Taiwan studies was not about Taiwan at all, or like they were, they, I'm not sure what was in their minds or hearts, but what was on the page was, this is about the study of China. So they bought fully into a discourse of Taiwan as a part of China. Uh, as, you, as someone used the word surrogate, actually, I think both of the other speakers used the word surrogate for the real China, the one that we would like to be studying if only we could. But that is a very different purpose for Taiwan studies, right, than what we're talking about today. 
it, the purpose of Taiwan studies was to study China and set that and that sets us up, of course, inevitably, to at the first opportunity pack up our tents and go when we get the opportunity to study the real China, the one that we wanted to be studying all along, but sadly we're stuck in Taiwan. And this is what um, you know, I, I, to get to the idea of marginalization or marginal, uh, Jonathan Sullivan, I think, is really right about marginalization, uh, that Taiwan studies is really not marginalized within China studies uh, to the way that, you, to the extent that you might expect that it would be. You know, I think there's, there's more about Taiwan in the sort of China studies discourse than there is about certain parts of mainland China. And the interest that people who specialize in the PRC take in Taiwan is very interesting, too. I mean, uh, of course, the early generation of, of uh, PRC specialists in my discipline, political science, uh, had to pay attention to Taiwan. The sort of next generation, one kind of just slightly senior to me, paid attention to Taiwan because many of them did language study there, and so they got sort of interested in it. So, you know, the older Taiwan, or China specialists know more about Taiwan than they do, say, about Mongolia, and maybe more about Taiwan than people from other uh, contexts would know about sort of similarly related entities as the PRC and Taiwan. Which you know, if you think about it from the standpoint of political scientists, it's a totally different toolkit that you're using to understand the PRC versus modern Taiwan. So, you know, I think I think it isn't marginalized. And then you look at how even young scholars, so those whose training did not require exposure to Taiwan, also take an interest. Some someone like uh, Peter Greece, whose work, you know, he he is a China scholar trained in China, but he's curious about Taiwan, and he's doing work on Taiwan now. And so, you know, I don't think it's marginalized. What I meant when I wrote uh, in the, the line that uh, Jonathan is quoting, what I meant when I said Taiwan is marginal to the study of China, was this kind of tendency to view Taiwan as an, an edge piece of the Chinese world. And that we are, that Taiwan didn't have weight of its own intellectually, nor was it centered in China studies. So what's happening now in this last period that I want to talk about is Taiwan coming to be the center of an enterprise which is about Taiwan, which is not about Taiwan as sort of a marginal entity in the Chinese world, a, a much larger Chinese world that is centered in mainland China. So compared to what? Well, compared to the 1990s, right? Is Taiwan studies in decline compared to the 1990s? And here I think we, we again can look, what was the purpose of Taiwan studies, at least in the West, right? So, the 1990s is when Taiwan studies in Taiwan just totally takes off. And you get that, that planet of its own that if I want to visit, I need to visit there. I don't, you know, I can't really expect those Taiwanese scholars to constantly be translating their work so that I can access it. So, you know, in the 1990s, planet Taiwan grows and goes into its own uh, orbit. So, but looking at Taiwan studies in outside of Taiwan and, and among scholars in Taiwan who are in steady and, and constant dialogue with those outside Taiwan, why was Taiwan studies so big in the 1990s? Well, I think, again, because of what the purpose of Taiwan studies was in the 1990s. In the 1990s, Taiwan was changing in ways that could not fail to attract the attention of scholars across disciplines. The developmental state was kind of reaching some 
inflection point and changing in important ways. So economists with an interest in the developmental state have to look at Taiwan through the late 80s and into the 90s. Politically, democratization, democratization was the most interesting and vibrant disciplinary preoccupation for political scientists in the 80s and 90s, and early 90s at least. And Taiwan was a, a, a huge case study that raised all kinds of questions that um, you know wasn't in in wasn't was inconsistent with a lot of our expectations. I mean, you know, great stuff, great stuff going on um, with democratization. So we were drawn to it by our disciplinary theories as a comparative case for studying other kinds of questions. We were also producing a lot about Taiwan in the 1990s because it was a super hot policy topic. In 1994 to 96 was a period of great tension in the Taiwan Strait. Immediately following a period where it looked like things were going in the in a very different direction. So I think the 1990s were really hot for Taiwan studies, certainly in political science, but I think that energy radiated elsewhere. Also, people drawn to Taiwan studies in other disciplines, especially history, saw the, the sort of cracking open of all of these questions and issues and documentation and archives and, and resources for the study of history thanks to democratization. So, you know, they got in on it in, in English and Chinese as well. So what I want to say here really is that, you know, if we see, it's a little like the Taiwan economy, right? You know, you can only have those, those super high growth rates for so long, and then things sort of level off. So maybe what we see is Taiwan studies or output in Taiwan studies leveling off after a really rocket trajectory in the 1990s. Um, so just to kind of conclude then, because I know I've taken, no doubt, more than my share of your time and attention, and I'm sure it's incredibly difficult listening to this kind of like disembodied thing happening. Um, where Murray leaves us in his presentation is with the possibility that Taiwan is now a sort of a planet fully in rotation, setting its own course with the gravitational pull of other celestial bodies rebalancing in a way that carries it away from really a kind of orbit around the West, if we can use that word, you know, the US European kind of centers of uh, academic study to um, an orbit that somehow carries it between those kind, that world and its own region, thinking about Taiwan, how, but also about how Taiwan, and thinking increasingly about how Taiwan fits in. And I don't want to say just relative to mainland China, because I think Taiwanese are thinking bigger than that. But certainly, the gravitational force of the mainland cannot be ignored or you know, underestimated. So that perhaps what Taiwan studies is is not in decline, but in transformation. And in transformation in a way that makes it harder for us Westerners to access even if the overall richness of that world is on the rise, not the decline. Maybe the problem is our ability to see it rather than its ability to exist. And with that, I will you know, sign off, and I hope you can have a Thank you very much. Okay, we um, we now have uh, well over a half hour for uh, a variety of.
some comments and discussions from uh, Planet Taiwan. I'm, I'm thinking that we have uh, we have a name for a new entrepreneurial business. I'm just trying to figure out what content it should have. There should be a, you know, a, a bunch of coffee shops or, or tea shops or some kind of, I don't know, I can just see Planet Taiwan outlets populating various various places in North America and uh, Western Europe and uh, uh, South Korea and uh, elsewhere. What's up? Hey, let's see the Confucius Institute. The comments about the Confucius Institute, I think, are, are uh, raise a lot of interesting uh, questions about sort of soft power and, and the exercise of soft power and the availability of, of national resources to invest in, in soft power. Uh, Taiwan, of course, has, has utilized such resources as has come out in our, in our discussion uh, quite effectively over a long period of time. Uh, the PRC, of course, is, is only more recently uh, able to do that, but it's certainly doing it uh, very, very actively. I myself have just come back from leading a group of uh, professors from different uh, smaller in, uh, colleges and universities around Indiana on a familiarization uh, trip to China that was partially subsidized by the Confucius Institute in Indianapolis. And uh, it, it's a very clear exercise in, in national soft power uh, that the mainland is utilizing very, uh, very effectively these days. Well, um, at this point, uh, we'd like to just turn things, uh, open things up for comments and questions from the audience. We have to do a little bit of um, an adjustment here so that Professor Rigger can hear the comments. So if you will make your comments uh, or ask your questions, uh, Derek will then use the mic to help Professor Rigger hear what's going on, and uh, then she or Professor Rubenstein will be glad to uh, answer and I'll sit back and listen. <coughs> so who'll be first? I'll, I'll indicate, please. <coughs> My question is for Mario Rubenstein. Uh, I appreciated this very neat history of, uh, of Taiwanese studies. Uh, it was really very helpful. But I was surprised that uh, one dimension of that research, you gave very little emphasis and that is the study of Taiwanese women. Uh, beginning certainly, maybe even earlier, but certainly with Marjorie Wolf, uh, there's been an emphasis on understanding the role of women, particularly within the Chinese family, which had been almost completely ignored in the context of these patriarchal structures. But since Marjorie Wolf and the influence she's had, certainly in feminist anthropology, uh, and those who came after, like Phil Gates and Emily O'Hearn, and several people who are in this room who are continuing to do research on uh, Taiwanese women. I, I wonder if you would agree that what is happening now in Taiwanese society, particularly for women, is an absolutely revolutionary period, perhaps unprecedented in the history of Chinese culture. I agree, and in fact, the paper does have a fair amount of material on uh, women in Taiwan, and, and uh, in particular, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I co-edited a book with Anru Li and Catherine Ferris on women in modern Taiwan, and that came out in the mid uh, I think uh, 2005, 2006, around then. And I'm very conscious of that issue. Uh, I had worked with Lu Xiaolian and uh, was uh, the recipient of her, uh, what became her autobiography written by somebody else um, in a variety of ways and made use of that document in my own piece in that book, which is the history of uh, you know, Lu Xiaolian and Taiwanese feminism. Uh, there's also Doris Chong's very, very important new book, uh, which is a grand history of uh, Taiwanese feminism and primarily in terms of issues, of intellectual issues and, and issues of various movements. So that is there, in fact, it's mentioned in the paper. Um, there is, a, a, again, a growing body of interest and, and people have worked on the various stages in, in a variety of ways. Uh, I was able, I believe it's in the late, uh, yeah, it's in the uh, eight, 1980s, late 1980s or so, 
that there was a major conference. Of, uh, first, one day was academic study of women in Taiwan. The second day was hands-on stuff. And it was the change of the movement to a kind of political feminism to a hands-on feminism in uh, social reality. And this was, and there were a lot of proceedings from uh, derived out of that and demonstrated the work. In terms of literature, uh, Cal Clark, for example, had written a major work on women in the political system. So, I mean, I don't think I, I you know, in the paper, the paper, uh, a 60-page paper cannot be completely I'll, I'll send you the copy and you'll see what I do with it because I'm very, very conscious of those issues uh, and, and what people have done in a variety of ways. And I agree with you. It, it, it's one of the major dramas. And uh, going from the Lucio Lian era to the post Lucio Lian era and, and a broadening sense of uh, the role of women in Taiwan. Yes, please. Um, if you'll state your question, uh, Derek will oh, no, no, it, it, this is a This is a general question for everybody. Okay. Yeah, first of all, I enjoy the presentation. The presentation very much. Uh, okay, I, I, I hope this doesn't offend any of you, but me being Japanese working in Taiwan, I get an impression that the presentations today, uh, especially uh, Dr. Rubenstein's presentation, uh, of course, I uh, know, and also uh, Sutherland's paper too. It's very Eurocentric or English centric. I know there is a vast literature on Taiwan studies during the Japanese colonial period. There's hundreds, thousands of, of, of literature which is now available. Taiwan is awesome in terms of digitalizing these materials. And if you go to the National uh, Central Library, Zhongyan uh, Tushuba, now they call it Taiwan Tushuba. And also, you know, Taida Library, they have like just tons of books. I would just love to live there and just read all these books. So I think that, uh, so it's, it's a pity that we're not having any, any anyone who's representing some of the kind of the scholarship that's, that has existed in the colonial period or the Japanese, and the Japanese scholars continue to study Taiwan. Uh, also the scholarship in Taiwan, I think it, it, it would be absolutely a pity to kind of write off all the scholarship that's happening in Taiwan as something insular, or parochial, well, me being Japanese is very insular and parochial, but I, I think the Taiwanese scholarship that's coming out in Chinese language is there's some really good work. You know, they, these scholars, you know, maybe uh, in, uh, in, in Qinghua or Shida, you know, they, they use, you know, at least three languages, Japanese, Chinese sources, and, uh, and English sources, and doing some really interesting work on how women perceive the you know, eros, you know, in the Japanese era, and and I think so, like, it could, it, isn't it that uh, there is, if there is a Taiwan studies in terms of perception that we feel that it's in, it's dying or in decline, which we all, which we, we kind of like, oh, oh, uh, 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 oh, I think we all have faith to believe that it is all alive, but if, if there is this kind of perception, isn't it because it's, we're, having this very Eurocentric uh, or English-centric viewpoint. And as a matter of fact, there is, is a, a sense of uh, generational or a geopolitical, a geographical shift in Taiwan studies. Now, a lot of Taiwanese elite, you know, the bright, the best and the bright, they would go to the Europe and come to U.S. They acquire the, the what, 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 the tools and the skills to do the analysis, and they go home and they're now building their own institution. And maybe they're, they no longer, Taiwan no longer, I think uh, Professor Rigger uh, kind of implies this, but they no longer need uh, a white man and white woman or another Asian to, to speak for themselves. The subalterns, if I find them, I call the Taiwanese, have, uh, are starting to speak of themselves. Uh, so I think there's, is, can you, someone can, some of you can comment on this. Point. And also, like Taiwan studies, just living in Taiwan and working in Taiwan, I think that the, the so-called what what the production I think somebody mentioned about the production of knowledge, it's actually I think in the past it was the scholars, but in Taiwan there are just a bunch of those amateur historians and bloggers who are doing wonderful work, and these are not published in peer-reviewed journals or whatsoever, but there's just so so, so amazing resources. Uh, 
and the last point uh, is about, I think that eats seems to be growing pretty well, healthy, and because they are rather empirical. They're uh, evangelizing into other European countries, the Scandinavian countries, or like, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, here, uh, East Asian countries, and, and they have this evangelical mindset, proselytizing other European countries and bringing them in. They're really successful. I think that you know, Stefan Korte, Jens Dahm, and all these people, and Haley Credit. But Nazi doesn't seem to be having that empirical mindset or having that white man's burden to bring Taiwan studies into Latin America or the Caribbeans or Hawaii or I don't know, uh, wherever. Uh, I don't know, I might be wrong. And uh, if also someone could mention about the Taiwan Congress, they seem to be bringing all these J Japan, Taiwan, and the Western scholars together. What are their visions and uh, what are their prospects? And one last thing, you can also comment on Taiwan academies. You know, I mean, the last couple of days, I there was a, you know, the Cultural Bureau, the, the Ministry of Culture, they, they announced that the uh, Long Impact announced that they're going to be building, establishing Taiwan Academy. Do you think it's going to be successful? Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. So thank you, sorry, thank you for your comments. We do need to consider, Professor Rieger can't necessarily hear okay. your comments, so Derek is going to do a heroic job. I hear that. Could you hear that? Yes. Oh, well, great. Then we, we don't need to, to go through that process, <laughs> but we, we may need to for some of your comments, so please, uh, we ask your patience while while we help Professor Rigger to hear what's going on if necessary. I'd like to pick up part of that. I, I think, you know, the, the, what the Congress demonstrated is that certainly Michael Chow has re you know, recognized that there was at least one major, if not two major, panels of Japanese scholars talking about the research done vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And I've met a couple at dinner, and, and they seem to be doing very, very good work. I think point I made before, the uh, publication of the conferences and the publication of uh, uh, David Wong and Liao Kui's book on the Japanese period has a mixture of scholars. There's Taiwanese scholars, there's Japanese scholars, I think there's some Westerners as well. And it's a very, very strong book Columbia published like, kind of over the course of this decade, I think. And it, 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 it's one example, but it may not be enough, uh, but, but certainly it's there. And the other conferences I've been to deal with a number of, uh, you know, the Japanese way of looking at or the impact of certain cultural figures in Japan and the way they have looked at those kinds of issues. Judith Ivey of Columbia, for example, looks at Japanese pop culture and then to some extent also looks at it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan. Other people have looked at those kinds of issues and the integration, I mean, one of the major things looking at pop culture in Taiwan is the impact of Japan in a variety of ways, and scholars have picked up on that. Uh, it's a very it, it, important element. It, it, I, I said at the outset I was looking at in, uh, English language, but I recognize fully that, and again, this is where the pioneering work of somebody like uh, Carolyn Tsai is important. She's literally read, led the way in terms of a lot of work of that integration and, and, and doing hands-on with it, and, and I think that's very, very important. Apropos of your other point, I'll, I'll just give you a little vignette. Um, it was last year it, during my, when I gave the, um, the paper at uh, Chow Tung, and then one full day was spent with Eileen Duff, who was in the middle of a lot of things. She's now teaching at, uh, as you know, at the, at the uh, medical university. But an important part of her work there is she's personal outreach. She's a bridge of sorts. And I went to a conference at the educational university sort of in that southwestern or southeastern part of Taipei. And there I met a lot of people I'd never met before. It, it is, to me, the equivalent of the difference between the Haredi, the hyper-Orthodox Jews, and the conservative and reform with, with the larger community being part of a larger world, and they're the Orthodox and Reform Jews, and the Haredi being very much uh, insular, etc. And they have a lot to teach us, but their insularity is there. The question, and I was fascinated by what they were doing, the question, but you have a two-world culture in Taiwan. You've got the upper levels of the university, you've got Academia Sinica, and then you've got the local people, the hard-working local scholars at the, the community colleges, etc. And the, twain, you know, the two groups, with a couple of exceptions, doesn't really meet. Who has control of the, the journals, etc., uh, etc. Et there should be a meeting of the minds. They're doing the grudge work, they're doing the basic work, they're doing the work of local American historical societies in given areas, and yet the amount of communication is not there, and, they, and this is 
but this is not my test. It should be the test of people at the institutes at Academia Sinica or the departments at Taiga, Shurda, et cetera, to be integrate this other kind of scholarship within the larger world that we're talking about. Okay, let's, let's give Shelley an opportunity to, to uh, address the questions. Yeah. You know, the, you, you're going to make me argue with my own self here. <laughs> because the truth is, I did not intend to imply what you said I implied. I meant to say it, like, clearly. <laughs> I uh, entirely agree with you that precisely what Taiwan is doing and should be doing is creating its own intellectual world that talks outside, but that doesn't but that talks back, right, and that has its own conversations, that isn't just passively or even actively receiving from the outside world. And that if we want to, if we, that is to say the, the, the non-Taiwan-based scholars, want to access it, we have to, like, go to conferences in Chinese and struggle with language in the way that our Taiwanese colleagues struggle with language when they are at conferences in English, they never complain, they never ask for us to, you know, can we do this in Chinese this time? It's, it's really kind of crazy how much of the discourse about Taiwan studies, and honestly also PRC studies, happens in English, given the overwhelming number now of native speakers or competent non-native speakers of Chinese in our community. So, you know, my first answer is, yes, you're right. Why didn't I say that clearly enough that you didn't, you know, feel you needed to, to say it again? I apologize. Um, but now I have to argue with myself a little bit because it does matter that we have some amount of discourse, and in fact, I think a lot of discourse about Taiwan in English because Taiwan's predicament is not only a kind of metaphysical or intellectual predicament of how do we know ourselves and you know all that stuff, which is really interesting, whatever, but there's also kind of like a, a strategic, military, economic, and political predicament for Taiwan that is the uh, kind of happy resolution of which requires the attentive commitment of policymakers and publics outside of East Asia. So that if Taiwan does, if Taiwan studies were to decline to the point where Taiwan were to disappear from the radar of American politicians and policymakers, that would be really unfortunate, even if the universities on planet Taiwan were thriving. So while I'm saying that I'm not worried about the decline of Taiwan studies as a sort of intellectual matter, because I think it's happening on planet Taiwan, and, and as I said, regionally, not just cross-strait, but also looking towards Japan, looking towards Korea, looking towards Southeast Asia, but I also, I do worry more about the, and this is really not our topic for today, but it's something that I think is not unrelated to our topic for today. I worry more about Taiwan's disappearance from the radar, the intellectual radar of American politicians. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Shelley, can you hear me? This is Joe Wong Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I have actually just two observations to make. And Maybe worthy of your comment or not, but actually the first is to follow on what Shelley was just saying. Um, being at the University of Toronto now, one gets a real sense of how the American Academy and its approach to Asian studies is so much shaped by a Cold War logic and a post-Cold War logic. And in many ways, Taiwan, at least on the social sciences side, benefited from this post-Cold War logic because Taiwan became a paragon case in many ways of prevailing debates within you know, foreign policy establishment inside the United States dealing with security, democracy, economic development, and so on, and the ideological debates within that establishment. 
as that post-Cold War agenda begins to peter out, I think we're beginning to see, actually, fewer and fewer hooks upon which Taiwan can attach itself in those sorts of theoretical debates. So my observation, actually, and notwithstanding the work of all the great social scientists in this room, is that uh, the real future of Taiwan studies is actually in the humanities. So I think in many ways that's where the theoretical innovations are taking place and are taking place outside of the envelope, at least in the American category, of what are American interests uh, in the region. That's the first observation. So, you know, as the director of the Asian Institute at the University of Toronto, I'm constantly coming across really interesting stuff in the humanities, and again, notwithstanding the work of my friends and colleagues in this room, less, so in the, less and less so in the social sciences than, than probably before. The second observation I want to make, and this again reflects um, Shelley's uh, observation that you saw this really rapid ramping up uh, of uh, Taiwan studies during the 1990s for all the reasons we know and, and we've just enumerated again. One of the phenomena as well at that time was that the academy in Taiwan filled up very quickly. And the observation I want to make now is that it seems to me that in many ways the academy in Taiwan, on planet Taiwan, generating this knowledge about Taiwan is also at full capacity. And so when we think about it, and this is really a comment directed to our younger colleagues in this room who are starting out in the academy, it's increasingly difficult to find jobs, not only in the North American Academy, but it's increasingly very difficult to find jobs in the Taiwan Academy. And given the simple demographics, uh, and you know, this is really, these are a lot of our friends, Shelley, who, you know, were in the field when we were in the field, they're not retiring anytime soon. Uh, so, uh, nor are we. Uh, but they're not retiring anytime soon, meaning that there is a real uh, tight labor market in the, in the academic labor market in Taiwan. And to the extent that planet Taiwan is a viable place and a robust place for the sorts of discussion we crave and the sorts of discussions we would like to insinuate ourselves into, it's increasingly difficult to, to find places for new people and new ideas. So those are just two observations that probably are a little more pessimistic than I want them to be, or intended them to be, but as I think them through, um, I suppose that's really what I can do. Thank you. Shelley, did you want to respond? No, I think those are, are very good points, and uh, <coughs> this is part of why when I travel to Shanghai, I meet Taiwanese academics working in, uh, you know, Shanghainese institutions every time I go. Here and then, and then far back. You first. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, and thank you for the presentation. I enjoyed that. And I'm Koi Paul. I am a geographer, human geographer from UW Ma Madison. Uh, I'm now, uh, uh, yes, I'm writing my dissertation. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, sort of follow up the co comments from, from Joe about the job market right now. It's more like the personal comments. I remember uh, when I proposed my dissertation proposal, the first draft of my proposal is totally focusing on Taiwan. And my advisor gave me a qu question is that, uh, where do you want to have a job in the few future, in the North America or back in Taiwan? And I say, uh, probably my first priority is uh, here in the U US or, or can Canada. And my advisor, he didn't uh, like uh, you know want me to change. He just you know suggest me to you know uh, do something. He suggest me to do something. I I can do something about Taiwan, but basically I have to broaden the field, possibly into China or something you know or Southeast a a Asia, something like that. In terms of you know in the future, I want to get a job, and uh, and that that's the 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 personal uh, experience here. And my personal, the sec second experience here is that when I write a grant proposal, uh, the first grant pro proposal, actually I didn't really uh, 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 
gave up my, my first topic about ta Taiwan, but I didn't get the grant. And then I took my advisor's uh, suggestion, then I did got a grant. <laughs> so uh, then I got on board, you know, to do my research in China. And uh, yeah, so I, I think my comment is that, so practically in terms of, you know, getting a job or you, because doing re research sometimes is all about money, right? And in terms of fun funding, right? So um, when we think about, you know, we want to say it's, it, you know, tai, tai, Taiwan is really in, in, important. Of course it's in, important, but in academia, in pra practically, somehow I also see a kind of marginalization in terms of about talking about Taiwan per se. We always have to think about, you know, something, you know, we can talk about tai Taiwan, but we have to broaden, you know, we have to talk about the relationship, you know, between Taiwan and the rest of the world. In terms of, you know, we want to get fun, we want to, we want to get a job in the fu future. Yeah, so uh, that's the first co comment I, I, I want to say. And the second comment is that uh, uh, I am a human ge geographer, you know, categorized as a soul, social, social science here. Yes, um, yes, it, it is true right now in social science, we less and less we see, you know, people do the tai, tai, Taiwan per se. But I, I would say uh, more like uh, optimistic. If we want to, you know, think about how to position Taiwan itself, I, 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 I think per Professor Koko, you know, just <coughs> for providing a, another potential to rethink about Taiwan, the liminality. We, we want to locate Taiwan, for example, the political economy of globalization. So we, we don't just talk about Taiwan. We want to, from Taiwan, then we base on Taiwan, then we think about the world, and we create a lot of dialogue with uh, another you know, colleague from other disciplines in social science. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's, yeah. give, let's give our panelists an opportunity to respond. Sure, and okay. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. So responses? Yeah, and if I can just say, I think your point about money has always been true. Um, those of us who, who were funded to study Taiwan alone were funded, I think, overwhelmingly by Taiwanese sources. So, you know, going to uh, an American foundation for money to study Taiwan, actually, I have been successful with that because my work has policy implications and this foundation is interested in U.S. policy toward Taiwan and, and that sort of thing. So I think this is why, this is um, part of why I think Joe is really right about the humanities. In the humanities, the, the, theoretic, the foregrounding of the theoretical issue means that you don't have to be studying a, a country that has, that is understood by the people who are evaluating your application to be inherently important you need to have a, a topic that's going to, to enrich human understanding of literature or history uh, more broadly. Whereas I think for social scientists, you know, you, you, you kind of have to make the case that, that the case you want to study matters in order to get uh, funding from sources beyond Taiwan. And uh, that has always been difficult. And just thinking about my own experience in the job market, you know, there's there's only one position that I know of in the US that is an endowed chair in Taiwan studies. And when they sent out the announcement for that chair, every field except politics, pol political science and politics was, was clearly not one of the things they were looking for. But they it was pretty wide open otherwise. Beyond that, you know, anyone who, who studies Taiwan politics as their scholarship is in a in a university position is teaching something much broader. And I think for me at a small liberal arts college, the fact that I had had to master Chinese politics, politics of Taiwan, Japan, in order to have a, a dissertation that was comparative of Japan and Taiwan, and I also had to 
know what was going on in Korea because I've been doing this sort of democratization thing. The liberal arts college looked at me and said, wow, she can teach all the countries of East Asia, that's what we want. This is very different from what a university is looking at, and I don't think I could ever, you know, I'm not ready to retire, but, you know, until I retire, I don't think I'll ever be uh, competitive for a job in a research university for this very reason. So, you know, I think it's a, you guys got to think about how you want to work, what kind of job you want to have. Fortunately, liberal arts college teaching is the best kind of work in academia. So it worked out for me, and I hope it worked for you, too. Thank you. Uh, we had a, you know, check shirt. Yes, yeah, and then we'll go behind you. Yeah, uh, what is I want to ask the question about it, the, the, the role of the state in the Taiwanese study, because I'm doing a research, competitive research between among Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And however, I found that the Japan, Japanese foundation and the Korean foundation support a lot of generous funding to the, uh, including travel grant and also the award. But however, that's a, oh, the only that's a funding source we can find is uh, from the Jiang War. And uh, whenever you want to apply for Jiang War, you always heard of, the, your friends will tell me, why do you want to apply for from a funding from a dictator or sort of very dictator, right? <laughs> so that's so kind of a, I mean, kind of a very, and also that's a, in my school, that's a Chicago, and right now I have, I have to apply for the like, travel grant, but there's an issue by the China committee. So my friends also have a voice, right? Why do you apply a funding from the committee of China? And do you mean that, uh, do, you, do you imply that uh, your, your research is, uh, is belong to the ch kind of a chi China study? So it's kind of a, it's kind of very trivial. But I think that uh, the role of the state, the Taiwanese state to play in this kind of academy is kind of ambivalent. Because even though I think that because of two years ago, I, I also am kind of a local administrator for the conference. And that time, that's, I think that the Taiwanese government didn't have a very clear idea how to sponsor and how to support the academic field in the, particularly in the North America. And so even though this NITSA funding is kind of a, not always supported by the government or by the state, right? So it's kind of a, they are kind of very hesitant to say we supported a clear term Taiwan study in North America. So, in, 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 so that back to the Professor Koga, that's kind of a, because Taiwanese say it's not so clear whether they want to call themselves as a Taiwan or a Chinese study. So they kind of, even though the Chongqing World Foundation Supported many for the China study. Right, so it's kind of a, I think that the state in this academy field is very important. However, I didn't find that uh, Taiwan, the Taiwanese state plays such an equivalent role as uh, Japan and also the South Korea play. Okay, let's, give our, more, yeah. let's give our, our panelists an opportunity to stop. Okay. Yeah, I'll let Marie take that one. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I have been very coddled. My university, uh, for the better part of 30 years, gave me uh, research grants that got me to, uh, one uh, application and got me uh, two years of travel. And so I, I have never quite been exposed to uh, the kind of uh, ugly and bloody battles that, that many of you were involved in. I've been very, very lucky that way. And when the time came that I was not at CUNY, uh, every once in a while, uh, Teco came in. I have good working relations with Teco in New York, and they came in because I was old enough to get the senior scholar grant or whatever. And the other great way, of course, is going by conference, and then that becomes a route. The trouble is, this is, you've got to be old and gray haired or white haired to get to that point, so I, I, I don't know if I can answer you about that. I think probably, in, in, in a practical sense, the best way to go is comparative. Because a lot of people have moved in that direction, and, and people, for example, who have spent their careers working on PRC stuff, when they come to issues uh, such as corruption, also want to compare it with what's going on at, uh, in, uh, uh, in Taiwan. Now, Dorothy Solinger is a good example. Uh, uh, she works out of uh, one of the, uh, the CAL system, and she was primarily done a lot of very, very important work on the mainland, but in one particular week, she did get uh, money to do work on uh, Taiwan, and her husband, Tom Bernstein, did something along the same line. So I think people, there's a, there is a necessary interaction that may have to take place in terms of grants, and I think it's better in general. I think the other, you know, but there's a funny, I have to add this, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow, 
we talk about integration, we talk about economic integration, we talk about cross-strains, tourism, etc. The sad reality is, well, you, and I experienced this a month ago, when you go to Palace, I went to Palace Museum on Monday. Slow day, no. The mainland was there. And you see that. You go to Taipei 101, mainland is there. However, the but is, that all this new cross-straits travel, particularly PRC to China, to Taiwan, is creating a negative effect. The more people get to know each other in Taiwan and China, the more they realize that they don't like each other. <laughs> and that's a sad conclusion, and that may or may not affect, but it, I think I would make the case now for more cross-straits as a viable way to go and a sellable point. I'd like to add one comment about uh, what Professor Rubinstein just said about comparative research. It seems to me that anytime you're sitting, say, like my own case, sitting in North America writing largely for a North American audience about China or Taiwan, no matter what I do, there are implicit comparisons being made. Uh, you know, because I'm writing about something that's not well known to most of my audience. Most of my audience shares my background, and I'm writing about something where we don't share the background. So there are necessarily there are implicit comparisons that people are going to be saying, well, how does this compare with, you know, the environment that we know? My own view is better to be explicitly comparative, be, you know, be open about that and build the comparisons into what you're doing uh, and bring them out front more. It's, it's a, a much more productive conversation to have than that. that was a yeah, we have, I think we have time for one final question on that from the back here. Okay. Uh, Dominic Yang from the University of British Columbia. Uh, in regards to the, uh, the state promotion of uh, Taiwanese studies in North America, I, you know, I have something from personal experience because uh, I'm, not, I'm a PhD student, I'm about to graduate, but uh, during my studies at UBC, I have, applied, I have applied to my department, the history department, to teach a Taiwan history course. And I got rejected for uh, three straight years. <laughs> then I later found out that there is actually a course being taught in Asian studies. And that's, the course is actually supported by money from uh, Techno, but, but through, uh, you know, from, through Techno, from Wai Jiao Fu in Taiwan. So, but, but then I applied to Techno for some funding for me to do research and also, you know, if I can teach this course in the future. But yet again, I was rejected again. So my point is that sometimes it's really the communication. Because I found out that there's a lot of bureaucracy in you know, ROC government. And sometimes they, they don't really get money to the people that are you know, wanting to do research and wanting to teach and promote Taiwan studies in North America. So you know, the, the, the thing I did that makes all the difference is that I, you know, you know, introduce myself to the new uh, you know, director of technical <laughs> in, in Vancouver. And now I have built up this relationship, so now I'm, I'm you know, I will be teaching that course <laughs> so, <laughs> in, in two months. So basically, you no, know, my point is really, it's really sometimes uh, for us to make an effort to make that, you know, make that thing work. All right. Uh, Professor, were you able to hear that? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think we're, we're touching, we're coming close to something that I do think merits some discussion, or at least bringing it in in the last couple of minutes, which is that Taiwan studies has also been a field that's politicized in ways that have not always been ideal for the academic process. And I'm not suggesting that there's political, you know, anything behind your particular experience, but a lot of the comments about funding and foundations and so on uh, can be understood at least partially to reflect the deeply controversial political debates in Taiwan and in the United States and elsewhere and these sort of uh, interactions among them. Uh, you know, I, if, Early in this presentation, Murray said something about when well, maybe he wrote the really pessimistic paper back in 2006 because the sort of green leaning academics were feeling uh, a little discouraged. And I think that's a really telling comment. It's, it's impossible, I think it's virtually impossible for a scholar in Taiwan not to be pegged as either 
on one side or the other. But it's also very difficult for scholars outside Taiwan to avoid being categorized that way. So if you take a grant from a particular foundation, then there are people who are going to judge your work based on, and judge your you know, sort of ethical quality based on who funded your research. And I really hope that we can move away from this. And I think the Zhang Jiguo Foundation's very professional approach to funding and also its willingness to fund projects that are not consistent at all with our sort of image of what Zhang Jiguo would have wanted his name attached to is a really positive development because it's helping, I hope, us to depoliticize academics and move away from this world where you know we're all either on one side or the other and what you write is judged not through the lens of the quality of the research or writing, but by the lens of do you agree with me on the critical issues of the day or not? Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Answer that really yeah. We, uh, let me, let me yeah. say, because we, we probably have another five minutes. So um, if Professor Rubenstein doesn't respond at uh, too much length, we can take another question or two. I'll make this uh, very brief and, and, and kind of reinforce uh, Shelley's point. In, 19, in 1990, right after the Bush way, there was a conference in Columbia. And it was too open a conference. DPP, Woman Don was there. After that, funding was cut from Columbia because it was simply too raw and too political a topic and things cooled down after that. I mean, that's one example where politics directly affected things. Again, this was last year as part of the grant that was money left over from the grant that Columbia got from TechCom. They wanted to bring in Shelby Kim, who was on the part of the DPP, speaking on the part of the DPP candidate, that money dried up and she had to find other sources. In that case, in the middle of the political race, TechCom people belonging to a KMT regime back home. And so politics has a direct effect in a variety of ways, and I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, thank you. Is there one more? Okay, we didn't get you way in the back. Finally. <laughs> thank you. No, I, I, just, I just wanted to share my frustrating experience with Brian Kirchhoff. Is it good to hear that many people have already created the Zaga if you just have Yeah, 
pretty much. Okay, so final, final thoughts? I guess I'd, I'd invite both our panelists to offer a final word or two, if you like, and then we'll, we'll bring this to a close. My impression, and this comes from a brief meeting I had with a student I knew from the University of South Carolina, who now finished his degree and is in Taiwan, thinking about the job market. He was in the same situation. The job was not there. The alternative becomes the think tank. I don't know how viable that is, but it may well be a kind of useful step for a while if there are enough think tanks, and then use that as a basis for uh, moving into formal academia. I, I that's the only note that, that that becomes one way to go, certainly a place like New York, certainly Taipei, uh, and probably, you know, PRC becomes a tricky question in a lot of ways, but in those cases that becomes one of the set of possibilities in the short run with uh, something to add to the portfolio. Kelly, do you have a final comment or two? Uh, as a final comment, um, first of all, thanks for taking this conversation seriously and, and really trying to think about what's happening with Taiwan studies and how to, how to keep it going. And, um, you know, I, I think I can't see you, but imagine that the future of Taiwan studies, at least the English speaking world, is, is in the room there. And so I would just say, you know, don't give up part. There's a lot of great material here. There's a lot still to learn. And we should we should worry about the state of the field, but we should soldier forward each individual thing every day and do what we can to keep it up. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Any comments? Thanks very much to our panelists.